hello everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. Well, Deborah mentioned earlier that we had a power cut, so the clock stopped um, at 10, 10.30. Anyway, the power has just come on and we're hoping it's going to stay on so that we'll be able to get on the simulators. Of course, while all the horses are fine when there's a power cut, of course, the simulator doesn't work. Anyway, uh, thank you. It's lovely to see you and so many people watching today. I hope you've had a great week. Um, it's great that so many people are tuning into our shows. We had a good turnout for um, Jackie's uh, TAC uh, lecture demo on Tuesday and also for the horse psychology um, on Thursday night. Um, so to keep up to date with everything that we're about to do, please look at our website. There's a link to all the upcoming shows that we've got. Uh, meanwhile, on today's show, uh, we've got a couple of slightly different things today. Caroline um, is actually going to be doing something on rider biomechanics. So she's asked that you all have a hard chair ready to sit on because she's going to do some exercises on that. We've got our usual uh, trivia and quiz. And of course, uh, Deborah just told us about, we're going to be hearing about um, Bertie's life because he, we see him a lot here at the stables. But at the end, we've got a new thing and I'm not going to tell you what it is yet, but you can win a prize. So stay tuned right to the end for our new little slot. But first of all, we're going to get some practical tips for everyone once we get back to riding from Nadia. Hello everyone, can you all see me okay? Sorry. Thumbs up. Brilliant. Okay. <laughs> Super. Okay, so today we're talking about contact. So what is contact? What contact is where you can lightly feel the horse's mouth at the end of the rein. Okay, just like this. What is a bad contact? Bad contact is where the rein's too long. I've got no control. Or when the rein's too tight. He's gonna be quite uncomfortable at this. Oh, head comes up, and he's hollering his back, not nice at all. Another one we could see is when the rein's a little bit like this. He doesn't like that either, very uncomfortable. So it's all about keeping our hands nice and still and having the correct rein length. So how do we achieve this? We do this by having a lovely soft hand, elbow and shoulder. Why is this important? Well, it's how we communicate with our horse. Let's talk more about our hands. So what's important about having a good hand position and how do we do this? So making sure our hands are four to five inches apart, having our thumbs facing the opposite ears, I've got a little prop here, you might laugh. <laughs> I certainly did when I started using it. But actually having a stick in both hands sort of demonstrates where our thumbs should be facing. Having a cross along the stick near the top is correct. Hopefully you can all see that. Lovely. What's incorrect is where we have our knuckles facing down, also known as piano hands, and we've lost our cross. Another one is having our hands too straight. We lose our cross again. What we're wanting to see is a lovely cross with our sticks. Um, and there we have it, lovely. Brilliant, well, as always, I like to have a little challenge for Nadia. So she's gonna jump off now and go into the sim room. Okay, whoops. Well, it wouldn't, oh, you're on the phone. Well, it wouldn't be a Wimbledon Village Stables uh, show if we didn't have a couple of glasses of Prosecco. So, Nadia is now going to demonstrate how you can ride. So, if you go into canter, Nadia. So, first of all, Nadia is going to canter. Now, she's got loose reins. Loose reins. And actually, I hope you can see this. You can see she's able to really hold the glasses of Prosecco very easily. And actually, this is pretty simple. There's lots of people on the internet who show their little videos cantering around like that. But what's difficult is if you keep a rein contact. So Nadia, now take the contact up on the reins. And you can see now her reins are the perfect length. She's got a contact all the way along, straight line elbow to hand to horse's mouth. And look at those two glasses of Prosecco. Not a drop is spilling. 
So it's a little bit of a funny stunt. I don't suggest you try doing this until you've done some exercises later. So later on in the show, we're going to come back and I'm going to show you some exercises that you can do on the sim that's going to help you to achieve perfect hands like Nadia's. Um, in the meantime, thank you Nadia, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> in the meantime, we're just going to go over for a quick poll. So, um, Sasha, can you set the poll, please? So you had a quick question to answer. Hopefully you've all answered that question. Okay, so thank you very much. Now, we're going to go over to the Costa del Claygate, where our reporter Claire, she's at the luxury holiday resort with the boys. So Claire, it hasn't been great weather today. Um, what actually are the boys getting up to on this cloudy day? Over to you, Claire. Thank you, Carol. Well, <coughs> It's actually quite sunny down in Claygate, but um, it was cloudy when I arrived a minute ago. Um, I thought I would wander into the field. So none of the boys, none of them have actually spotted me yet. Some people um, were asking, um, you know, which friends, uh, or, you know, which horses pair up which, with who and, um, and, and why they might be friends with each other. Well, the answer is, you know, they're just like people, some horses, you know, some people we get on with, some people we don't, and the horses are pretty much the same. So I'm just wandering down. So here we have Mr. Lovely uh, Hudson. He's, he's grazing. I don't know if you can see. I'll try and walk a bit faster so I can get to him a bit quicker. But I think if um, Hudson was wandering round the Costa del Claygate, if it was his holiday resort, I imagine Hudson might, you know, like something a bit sort of relaxing and fun. A bit like um, maybe some kayaking um, or, or something similar to that. They still haven't spotted. Oh, here comes Merlin. I'm not sure if you can see Merlin. Merlin's, Merlin spotted me. He's just wandering over. And I kind of think, you know, th this is no reflection on their own, by the way. But, you know, Merlin sort of quite likes it. He quite rates himself, I think, Merlin. He's a handsome boy. So he would probably normally, on a sunny day, he would probably maybe be sunbathing in a speedos or something like that. Um, as he, here he comes wandering over. Hello, Hudson. And here's Anne's lovely boy, Hudson. Here, <laughs> wait there, boy. Um, and um, give him his little pat. Here we go, Hudson. You can say hello to everybody, including your mum. No, 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 don't make faces at Merlin. And uh, we're not going to give them polos today because, um, I don't know, we might get mobbed like we did last week. Here's lovely... Merlin and um, Merlin looks great at the moment he's definitely made the most out of his eating and uh, a bit like some of the people in lockdown I think maybe um, his girth is going to have to go on a few uh, holes lower than it normally is aren't you darling right here give Merlin a nice big pat here and now we still haven't seen the other one so we're, I'm looking for Mr Naughty Boy Oliver so we decided this morning that if Oliver was on holiday at a lovely resort he, he would be the one dive bombing into the swimming pool and getting everybody soaking wet now the other boys are right up at the top here we run up here's mr louis on um, louis 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 like the security guard at fee time and he likes to uh, look off to the gate make sure nobody gets his gets a lunch uh, breakfast i should say or uh, or dinner before him and um Louis, Louis, we thought we are. Louis, he must be like a kite surfer. He's quite a cool dude. And he would be out hitting the waves with his lovely kite surf. Hey, Lulu. Um, there we go. He's coming over now. Come on, boy. And uh, it's lovely down here after the rain last night. Um, definitely much needed rain. And, uh, hey, boy, you wait here. There's a good boy, Lulu. Hey. Um, Hudson's coming now. They're all following. Now they probably think they're going to get um their uh, dinner in time soon. Louis, you stay there. Stay. Wait. Wait. Good boy. So the boys they're a little bit friendlier than walking around the field with than the girls. Um, but even so, we aren't going to uh, um give them any treats today. Might try and run up Jasper and 
and Scooby are having a nice scratch with each other at the top. You know, try and run up there. His lovely onyx. And you might can see. So two weeks ago when we came down this beautiful tree, so there's these lovely, lovely trees down in this field. Um, they didn't actually have any leaves on at all. And um, you can see what a difference two weeks makes. Um, and the horses are enjoying the shade underneath them. Oh, here he comes. Here comes Mr. Dive Bomber coming over. But in the meantime, here's lovely Onyx. Hello, darling. And Onyx will give him a nice little pat. And as you can see, Onyx is also looking very well. Let me go from the other side, Louis. Don't chase him away. You can see his shine on Onyx's coat. He's <laughs> But yeah, Louis, Louis's uh, herding Onyx away now because he wants the attention. We'll go back. We we'll might be able to get back to Onyx. Here he is. Hey, have you been jumping in the swimming pool and getting everybody wet, Mister? Hey, here's Oliver. He is a good boy. Hey, have you? I think because Oliver's just like a little playful. <laughs> Stand back. <laughs> Stand back. He's just like a little playful puppy, really. And uh, all he wants to do is um, have lots of attention, either from us or the horses. Um, and Rupert, here's Mr. Lovely Rupert. You can see they all nicely spaced out. Well, hopefully you can see, I don't know, you can, it's quite bright down here, so I can't see uh, I, my, camera, uh, my screen very well. Um, here's Mr. Rupert, and you know, oh, a lovely big mouthful of, come on, oh look, they're gonna have a nice scratch, Oliver, scratch, not, come on. Back, Mr. Rupert. What would Rupert do? I think he Rupert would probably be somebody who's out on the pedalos, possibly. I think. Hey, boy. Come on. Oh, we move back a bit and come on back, back. We'll just move them back a bit. Back, back. Come on. Back, back. Let's let Merlin. I mean Mario have his turn of in the camera, and he's beautiful, Mario. So somebody's going to have to wear the lip, red lipstick soon. One of the girls. I think maybe we'll have a competi uh, uh, competition or something one day. To see who's got to put the lipstick on and come and give Mario his kiss because it's uh, it's all worn off and Jane will have to let us know what shade of red we have to look for and uh, uh, and get for him something that's uh, you know nice maybe a bit waterproof um, I don't know very much about lipstick um, but uh, yeah to, and that uh, in a, you know stays on for a long time um, here uh, we have whoop, him and Scoob. Right, here we go. Here's cool dude, Mr. Scooby. I think Mr. Scooby, his sort of favorite uh, holiday activity would definitely be with his sunnies on, cruising around in his little speedboat. Hey boy. And you can see, so for those of you that um, saw Scooby when he arrived, he was like a, a, a mushroomy sort of color. And now his, uh, yeah, hey boy, his uh, summer coat has come out. Um, and you can see he's beautifully shiny um, and he's gone very, very dark. Um, black, Scoob, away. Oh, hi, darling, Jasper. I think Jasper, I think, you know, he's got to be like his mum. He's, he, I think Jasper would go for the spa day. Nothing too uh, um, adventurous, maybe. I think, oh, oh, and if he goes, Jasper definitely, I think, would like a little spa treatment. He would. Um, so in a couple of weeks ago when we came up, we didn't have Dan in the field. Um, and now some people do remember gorgeous Dan. Come on, Rupert's back. Sorry, Rupert's mugging me. Back, 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 back. And here's gorgeous Dan. So Dan uh, retired uh, last summer. Um, and um, he lives down here permanently in his retirement. So as you can imagine, it's not a bad retirement to have down here. And he's obviously had a busy day, a nice big yawn. What have you boys been up to before we arrived, hey? That you're yawning, Mr. Dan? And Scoob, <laughs> stop following me. Who else have we seen? And, oh, Jack. So now that I'm sort of uh, at the top of the field here is where we um, have their food um, and uh, where we bring them in every day. So now that I've sort of wandered up this way, they've all come, they're all following me now and heading towards the gate as if to... Uh, it, you know, hint to me basically that they want their uh, their dinner but it's a bit early yet we don't feed them until I'm just after five and Jack Jack come out the puddle I don't want to walk in the puddle and here's Jack we thought Jack with his you know lovely long legs would definitely be a keen water skier maybe cruising around on his slalom ski 
wouldn't you, boy? And I'm not going to Jack, come, come. Let's see if we can get him out of the out of the puddle. Come on, Jack, come out. And I think, is that all of the horses? I think we've seen them all. Just, but you can see them all now wandering around. So it's been lovely, obviously, in the last few weeks coming down because there has, you know, it's been lovely, lovely sunshine and uh, not an ounce of rain, even though we need the rain. And uh, you can see now, just from a little bit of rain because of the soil here, um, we have a little bit of mud and a bit of slipping and sliding, but the um, the grass is definitely going to need it because the boys have um, have enjoyed the grass down here and have uh, mowed it down, right down, but th th there's still plenty, plenty um, of grass left. It's quite interesting. So horses are creatures of habit. Um, uh, so hopefully you can see. And so when they're down the bottom there, I don't know if you can see, but they've formed a sort of a path um, through the middle here. So they, they, they do, even though, you know, they can walk anywhere, they do tend to walk on the same tracks um, when they're venturing from one side of the field to the other. So I think you can see that a bit. So you can see the path now that they've made when they're walking all, all the way down from that lovely bottom end there up to the top end to get their uh, water and their dinner. <laughs> Scooby's coming back for more. No polos today, boys. Anyway, um, I think next we are going to hand over to Caroline, who is going to talk about the biomechanics, Scooby back, who's going to talk about the biomechanics of riding. Over to you, Caroline. Carol, you, Caroline, you need to turn the volume on. Oh, I've been muted. Unmuted. Right. Hello, everybody. So, Leah, can you mute yourself? Okay. So, I just wanted to thank Claire from the field. It's really interesting seeing the horses in their natural habitat. Um, they went from being urban horses to rural horses without going totally feral because we've been seeing them twice a day and feeding them. So we're very lucky that it's just up the road from where I live. And now we're going to be thinking about my show and tell, except that this time it's going to be you guys interactive, hopefully on a hard seat. So if you've got a chance to find yourself a hard seat, not a sofa, I'm going to suggest you get sat on that for the next moment or two. So we've been out um, walking and cycling. Coronavirus has made us exercise, I'm sure, but not many of us have the opportunity to go riding. But we're going to have a go at riding in a way, and we're going to look at our seat bones. They're very important biomechanically to give us a base of support for a deeper seat. So if you've found a hard chair to sit on, the next thing is I'm going to get you to put your hands under your buttocks on either side and sit on them palm up. You should find it's uncomfortable, particularly if you're in the right upright position. So we'd love you to sit like a living, breathing statue, your full height, your full width, and hopefully it's painful onto your fingertips, which have slid under your mid buttock line. And if it's painful, you know you're in the right direction. We're going to imagine our sitting bones that we're on shine all the way down to the floor beneath you. And if you roll around a little bit, you'll feel the pressure changes. At its most painful spot, you're probably upright. And then we're going to practice having a fault in our posture. Some riders go over tall and they pull in their backs and they push out their chest. And unfortunately that puts us into a hollow seat. And then when you do that, you're no longer over your seat bones in the same way. Do you notice they're pointing now to the back? Let's come upright again. Hopefully you'll find your really painful fingertips under your sitting bones. And we're going to go the other way. We're going to slump a little bit, the chair seat. And you'll notice that your sitting bones have rolled forward. So those beams of light shine forwards. But we can get them to point all the way down to the floor again if we come upright like an Olympian. So if we can sit to our full height and our full width, hopefully you've got quite ouchy fingertips. We're going to stay on our hands just a little bit longer, but I will give you some respite in a minute. If we let our sitting bones stay equidistant from our own spines, that's a very level seat. But sometimes we intentionally want to move the sitting bone closer to our spine. So let's see if you can use your right sitting bone and glide it towards your own midline and then back away to the center. 
And then we're going to try our left sitting bone, moving that towards our spine and back again. So hopefully you now feel this equal pressure on your hands again. Sometimes when we want to turn a horse or do lateral work, or even going into a canter, we'll move a sitting bone closer to the spine of the horse. And in that situation, what we don't want to do is kink in our waist. And we don't want as well, if we move one sitting bone towards the spine for the other sitting bone to roll away. But if you do find there's a C shape to the left, you're probably not equally over your sitting bones. If you've got a C curve to the right, you're probably not equally over your sitting bones on that side. Okay, having done that, we're gonna take our hands away and give them a shake, I'm sure they're painful. <laughs> I've got my hands just in front of me because there's another exercise I'd like you to try. I'd like you to clench both buttocks quite tight. And when you do that, you probably pop up a bit higher and then relax them off again. Now, I'm not saying we should ride with clenched buttocks. The point I'd like to make is that it's possible to move both sitting bones towards your spine without popping up and then release them again back to a neutral spine. So you can narrow both sitting bones without necessarily clenching the muscle mass which pops you up. And we shouldn't pop off the saddle because that would be a not deep seat. We want to be into the saddle so that we have a deep seat. Although there's a lot more of that to do with leg position on another occasion with me. So now let's pretend we're going to go for a ride. You might see Wimbledon Common behind me in that picture, so to speak. So we're going to use our imagination and go for a ride with your mind, if you like. We're going to pick up imaginary reins. And with our imaginary reins, you might want to shut your eyes even, we're going to get ready to walk on. And as we walk on, the rhythm is a very steady, rhythmical one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. The horse's rhythm in walk goes back, front, back, front, from side to side, it'll be left, left, right, right, left, left, right, right. But the rhythm is very metronomic, one, two, three, four. And you'll notice your own sitting bones might be forwards, forwards, one side, the other side, because it's mirroring our own walking gait, which is why they use hippotherapy with quite a lot of disabled folk. So riding for the disabled and so on, they want the action of the horses to move the riders' bodies. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. I notice I'm now moving my hands, but I think I'm trying to illustrate, it's a bit like a steam train having pistons one side, the other side, back, front, back, front, and so on. Now, if the horse moves forwards and we get ready for a trot, we're going to be going quicker. One, two, one, two. It's a diagonal pairing, remember? Back, back, left, front, right, right, front, with the back, left. Uh, anyway, I said it wrong way around, but you know what I mean? Diagonal pairs, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. And if we're sitting equally to the one, two, one, two, we might be in sitting trot, or you could imagine rising trot if you went clench, release, clench, release, clench, release. So having trotted for a little way, we know we're going to canter from a sitable trot. Can we all imagine a canter transition coming up? Are we ready? Get set, and we're in canter. Now I've put one leg forwards. My left leg's gone forward, I'm on the left lead. If we were cantering, my outside leg would be back, my inside leg would be forward, and it's one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And that steady pulse goes from behind. It's a hind leg, which is why your outside leg goes back for canter. The next diagonal pair in front of the hind leg, followed by the leading leg. You see out the corner of your eye, da da da. So in the ring, you'd be skipping to the left. Or should we have a flying change, everyone? Like Moita, are we ready with Libertino? Yes! To the right. So I've changed my leg position, my hip position. I'm skipping to the right, to the right, to the right. And you might not be joining in with me in this, but I'm having a good time imagining my ride on Wimbledon Common. Anyway, we're going to walk again, we're going to halt again, and we're going to remember Carol's talk, if you saw it the other day, has a lot about intention. If you do go in an arena with a horse, you've got to know that you can be direct with the horse. You offer guidance and leadership, you have great expectation, and then the horse is convinced and goes where you want it to go. So we ride with intention, with stability, with poise, our full height, our full width. And I'm sure Charlotte in a minute will give you exercises to keep you riding fit. When we're back on the common, it's going to be great fun. And now we're going to go over to John. Thanks, everyone, and goodbye.
Thank you, Caroline. Um, thank you for those useful tips for when we all start riding again. And I have to say at one point, I was actually sort of going around the room on the left rein, uh, feeling quite unsteady because I'm out of practice. It is now um, poll time and it's also celebrity time. So come on, oh, sorry, I was going to say come on in, but social distancing, we better keep it a bit distant. Now, we have got results coming in, but before we do that, I think it would be opportune just to uh, take a little review of the candidates today. So first of all, we have Hugh Jackman. Uh, Hugh Jackman came to ride at the stables a few years ago with Carol. He spent a day where he was being interviewed on horseback for a glossy magazine. And as we know, he has gone on to become famous for his Wolverine character in X-Men. Uh, he's a Hollywood A-lister and he's an all-around good guy. So we've got that Hugh Jackman, all-around good guy, A-lister. Next, we've got Martin Clunes. Now, Martin is local. He grew up in the village. And we know that Martin is also a firm supporter of horses because he's been a former president of the BHS. Martin, uh, you will know, of course, you'll be familiar uh, with his irascible character, Doc Martin. Uh, I also think of him in the series a few years ago, the iconic series, Men Behaving Badly. Well, Martin brought his horses to the stables and they behaved very well. And we had an excellent day where Martin did a presentation at the White Onion to raise money for the BHS. So Martin Clunes, horses behaving well, he's our second candidate. Michael Portillo, um, politician, um, broadcaster, man who talks to us about trains, man who wears loud colours. Uh, he's had a colourful political career. He's now got very colourful jackets and trousers. His connection with the stables, well, many years ago, Michael, or not that many years ago, uh, came and had a lesson with Caroline, learned to ride in a day. Yes, one day, uh, learned to ride with Caroline. And that was for Michael Portillo's series that he was doing on Spanish television. So Michael Portillo, the man who talks about trains. Now the results are coming in and I'm pleased to announce the results now. Um, Michael Portillo is not the winner. Um, Michael Portillo came in with 9% and that's on a 79% turnout. I think he would have been a little bit disappointed about that if he was still in politics. Martin Clunes is also not the winner. Um, but a re very respectable 34% for Martin Clunes because he's an all-round good guy. He's president of the BHS. He's one of us. He's a, he's a rider. And the winner is on 57%, that's 57%, Hugh Jackson, all-round good guy, Hollywood A-lister and good friend of Carol, 57%, Hugh Jackman is the winner. Now, I sent a message out to Hollywood just to ask to have a few comments from Hugh and his words were something on the lines of I will always remember that day at Wimbledon stables that lovely ride with Carol she was so wonderful I will always keep in touch with her please send her a kiss and that was from Hugh Jackman so we come to the end of the polling and um, before we move on, there are people there who deride experts and they say that an expert is somebody who knows everything about nothing and nothing about everything. Well, I'm going to show you the person who knows everything about everything because Sarah is going to talk to us about some more horse trivia. Uh, over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much, John. Um, in fact, you're completely wrong. I know everything about nothing or nothing about everything. I don't know which way around it is. But my trivia section today is anything but trivial. I'm going to tell you the history of something, um, an invention that you will be surprised about. You'll be surprised how long it took to be invented. Um, and you might also be surprised when you find out how much influence it has had on all of our lives. Um, it's a device, uh, an invention which should rate up there amongst the great inventions of all time with the wheel and electricity and so on. It's something that you use every time you go riding. It's the humble stirrup. So I'm going to tell you the story of how it came about, and I, I think you'll be surprised to find out why it took so long. Uh, but let's go all the way back to um, about 4,000 years BC, when horses were first domesticated. 
they were probably domesticated first for their meat, I'm afraid to say, and also their milk even. But they, their potential for um, transportation and also for warfare was quickly realized. And soon ancient man was riding around on their backs. We think that he first sat very far back on the horse, sort of over his haunches, over the horse's haunches, a bit like some, you sometimes see people riding donkeys today, so right far back. But that seat gradually came further forward. And by about seven or 800 BC, uh, rudimentary saddles were being used, but there was no sign of stirrups. It is thought that you might have found a, a, a piece of rope or leather slung around the horse's um, stomach so that the rider could tuck their feet in, but there were no stirrups as we um, know it. So how did people get on and off their horses? Well, probably just by leaping or vaulting or by the time-honoured method that those of us who are, need to get up from the ground and have difficulty maybe by having a leg up. And there's a story that dates back to 522 BC, when a king of the Persians, and his name was Cambyses, he apparently leapt onto his horse, as, as they were all doing in those days, but he had forgotten that he had his sword tied around his waist. And unfortunately for him, he pierced himself through the thigh with his sword. And he died three weeks later of gangrene. Now you would have thought that this episode would have been enough for some inventive soul to have come up with a better way of getting on and off your horse. But no, still no stirrups. Let's get on to Alexander the Great, one of the greatest soldiers of all time, greatest tacticians of all time. He had an amazing army. Most of those were, well not, not most, lots of them were mounted but they didn't have stirrups. And I want you to imagine for a moment, you would have had to have channeled, I'm looking up Caroline's word, your biomechanics, to have stayed in your, in your seat, on your horse, while you were charging at full pelt with your spear in your hand. Um, and when you let go of that spear, you have got to let go of it at exactly the right time because if you're still holding onto it when it hits its target, you'll be catapulted off the back of the horse. But you've got to throw it with enough force to penetrate your enemy. You've also got to retrieve it because you need it for your next skirmish. So Alexander the Great's um, cavalry, no stirrups. Many of you will know about the great emperor of China, the first great emperor who unified China. He built the Great Wall and he, of course, had the terracotta army in his um, tomb. Uh, about 8,000 warriors were unearthed and amongst them there were lots of horses, all carved in beautiful, intricate detail. Some of you may have seen them, been lucky enough to see them, but they don't have stirrups. So even up until that was about 250 BC, still no stirrups. So when did we first have stirrups? Well, it's thought that there were some people in Northern India around the second century BC who had what you might call a toe stirrup. So it was a little loop of rope that they might have stuck their big toe into to give them a little bit more stability in the saddle. But that only works if you're in hot climates and riding barefoot, pretty useless for the uh, Asian cavalry men uh, wearing their boots in very, very cold regions of Mongolia, for example. Um, the first stirrup that fully accommodated a foot, an entire foot, came from China and it was discovered in a tomb on a pottery horse, but there was only one of them. And so it was deduced that that was simply for mounting, not for stability and riding. But the Chinese, like many inventions at this time, I hesitate slightly to say this with all the things that the Chinese have given us throughout the, the, uh, the years, and the, including coronavirus, but they are uh, credited with giving us the stirrups as we know them today. So a pair that were used for mounting and that's kept you stable in your saddle. But how did they spread? Well, possibly through bitter experience. Imagine if you can, that um, you're in a battle and you're on your horse with no stirrup, and your enemy has a cavalry who do have stirrups. Well, probably after such a clash, those who were lucky enough to survive in the defeated side would have got in the unstirruped side, I should say, unstirruped side, they would probably go straight home and um, devise themselves a pair of stirrups. And we think that that's how the idea of stirrups spread across into Europe. And we know it came into Europe in about the 7th and 8th century AD. Um, the Battle of Tours in northern France, 752, they had stirrups by then. We think it came to Britain 
The idea came to Britain probably from old King Canute, the Viking, who came over here and uh, defeated us in the, I think it was about the 10th century. Canute, he who tried to t control the tides and so on. So we had stirrups around the 10th century. So about 100 years before our Battle of Hastings. We'd certainly had them at the Battle of Hastings, although it didn't do as much good, did it? Um, but we're now coming into an era when um, historians think that the stirrup played a part in shaping society. And that's because stirrups gave knights a much um, steadier and more stable seat and therefore elevated them almost literally and metaphorically in society. And knights who were a sort of a band of free fighting men um, who swore their allegiance to the king and in return were given land and high status. And as a result of that, you get the serfs and the peasants and sometimes slaves as well. So in other words, the feudal society. So some historians say that the stirrup played quite a major part in how the feudal society started and carried on. And in fact, it carries on all the way across Europe and, and Britain until the Industrial Revolution. So maybe the stirrup did play a small part in, in forging society. But I have another better example, I think, of how stirrups changed society. We're going to fast forward to the 13th century, to Central Asia, and there is a force that's coming from the steppe lands with the power that has never been seen before. It's the hordes of the Mongols under their leader, Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan, through his own charisma and force of character, united all the disparate tribes across the steppe lands of Central Asia, and they were unparalleled horsemen. They were absolutely brilliant on their horses, and I've got many more stories of that, which uh, if you will let me, I might tell you a, a, another time. But they also had a secret weapon, and that secret weapon was that they use a much sturdier and stronger stirrup with a metal iron than anybody has ever had before or used before. And that enabled them to ride their horses at flat out gallop without using their reins. And that meant that they could fire off arrows from their bows at a rate that was sort of like the equivalent of a 13th century machine gun. And this is one of the reasons why the Mongols were so successful in their battles across Central Asia. Um, they also could not only fire their arrows going forwards, but the Mongols had a very clever little strategy that they used to employ, which was they would pretend to retreat. So they would turn around and leave their enemy thinking that they were victorious. The enemy was victorious and that the Mongols had retreated. But in fact, as soon as the enemy came down to pursue them and to finish them off, they could turn around using their stirrups for stability and fire off those arrows again to the the uh, enemy who was coming up behind them. So it seems like the stirrup played a part in creating one of the greatest empires, or well, in fact the greatest empire that has ever been seen in history. There's never been a larger land empire contiguous, all touching, reaching from the Pacific Ocean all the way to the Black Sea and the North Sea, so right into Eastern Europe. And that was in some small, maybe quite large way, helped and created by the stirrup. So it's said that some of us, oh, all of us maybe in Europe, have a little bit of Genghis Khan in our DNA. And if that's true, I'm not sure it is. I sort of hope it is. Um, then maybe some of that is caused by the stirrup uh, and, and the use of the stirrup. So next time you are cantering along and you lose your stirrup inadvertently, or maybe your instructor says, now remove your stirrups and let's do some work without them. You're going to have to channel your inner cavalry man from the hordes of Alexander the Great. And if you uh, also pay attention to what Caroline was saying and what Lottie's going to tell you, maybe you can develop the core strength and inner thigh strength that you need to do that. So that's all from today and I'm going to hand over now to Sarah with her wonderful quiz. So over to Sarah. Wow, what an act to follow Sarah, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, I feel like I've, I've learned so much today and I must add it to my notes from last week. So thank you very, very much, Sarah. Right, on to the quiz. Um, Nadia will be very relieved to know that she hasn't got to go racing around the yard for our quiz this week. Um, so we're back to more of our normal format. For those who, who are new this week and haven't done the quiz before, in the chat function, you just need to make sure that the two is addressed just to me, Sarah Chittenden, um, and then it's the fastest person with the correct answer who wins the question. So all to play for today. We'll have our usual six questions. So if you're all ready for question one, whereabouts on a saddle is the cantle? Whereabouts on a saddle is the cantle? <clears throat> oh, some very quick answers coming through. 
few correct, a few incorrect, interesting. Okay, so uh, well done, Tash. Well done, Charlotte. Well done, um, somebody who's called user, but I'm not sure who that is. Um, but the correct answer, the quickest correct answer, came from Kath, and it's the back of the saddle. So the cantle is the little bit that rises up at the back of the saddle. So well done, Kath. And Louisa also got the correct answer <coughs> as well. Susie Robertson, who is a saddler, decided that she'd throw me off the scent by saying it was at the front and has now said, ha ha, well done, Susie. Um, right, question two. Um, in which horse sport is the use of the voice strictly forbidden? In which horse sport is the use of the voice strictly forget, forbidden. Oh, very, very quick answers coming through. Well done, John. Well done, Marion, Emma, Leah, Tash, Rory, Kath. Lots and lots of people coming in with correct answers. But the quickest answer came from Deborah Hall and it's dressage. Well done, Deborah. You take question two. Fantastic. No voice allowed in dressage. Question three. In show jumping and eventing, just covering all the elements of a three day event here, in show jumping and eventing, what color flag is used to mark the right hand extremity of a fence? In show jumping and dressage, what color flag is used to demarcate the extreme right handed side of the fence? Well done, Kath. Well done, Shane, Deborah Tarrant. Well done, Jen. Uh, the fastest answer correctly came from. Emma, Emma Kofi, well done. Well done, Emma. Very quick. Um, question four, and it was red. Sorry, did I say that? My apologies. It's a red flag, red flag on the right. Okay, how carefully were you listening to Sarah just now? I think we were all um, glued to what Sarah was saying, but who can remember which country appears to have invented the first stirrups? Which country appears to have invented the first stirrups? Well done, Shane, Emma, Jan, Heidi, excellent. It's gonna, all these answers coming in very thick and fast. They obviously were listening very carefully, Sarah. The fastest answer, correct answer is from Conrad. It was China. So we had the toe stirrups um, that Sarah talked about first, but they weren't um, a, the a, traditional stirrups in the way that we might think of them. So the first ones of those came from China. Right, moving on, I'm going to share my screen for, our, for this week's emoji question. Some of you will remember my daughters have put these together. Um, and I think this week's is probably a little more challenging. So I'll leave it up for a little bit longer than <coughs> I have done previously. So anyone coming up with what equestrian linked um, question this emoji might be showing? Okay, I've got to scroll down to my new messages. Oh, <laughs> I've got angry flag, yes, with <coughs> saying what we see. Well done, Emily. Uh, Deborah Tarrant, very quick again. Emma, both Emmas, two Emmas. And Helen, very quick with the correct answer. But Charlotte Evanson got that one with the correct answer. It's cross country, cross country. So well done, Charlotte, and well done to everybody else who got that correct as well. And our final question, as usual, we'll go on to a little bit about how well do you know WVS and perhaps its history. Um, we are due to celebrate a big anniversary this summer. What year did Carol open Wimbledon Village Stables in its current form? What year did Carol open Wimbledon Village Stables in its current form? Lots of people coming back with how many years we're celebrating. But the first person with the answer, my true teacher mode, with the correct answer, which was what year did the stables open? The quickest answer that's correct came from Susie Robertson. It was in 1980. So we are celebrating 40 years of Wimbledon Village stables this summer. And let's hope that we're all out of lockdown and able to celebrate properly with what will hopefully be one very, very big party indeed. Um, that concludes our quiz for today, and I'm going to hand over to our very own NHS hero, Rachel, who's going to tell us all about her fantastic, wonderful horse, the brilliant Bertie. Tissues at the ready. Thank you, Sarah. Can you all see my screen? So. 
It's a great treat to be able to talk to you about Bertie because I love talking about Bertie. So we're going to hear all about him today. And what I'm going to ask you is not to give him a carrot. And we're going to find out why as we go along in the talk. So the story of Bertie really begins at the end of November 2016 when he first came to the yard. And as many of you know, we get our horses from a dealer in, in Ireland called Gertie in the centre of Ireland. And all you see when you're, when you're given your, your, your look at the horse is a 10 minute video. So this is like Bertie's application form to come and, and join the stables. So here he is looking very smart with his rider up above. And here he is jumping. But some of you will remember that before Bertie, we had uh, a couple of really very opinionated mares who would buck you off just for fun, really, out of sheer temper. So the thing that really did make me think Bertie was the horse for me was this clip from the video where the rider in the arena goes around the world on the saddle on Bertie and then she gets off over his back. She descends by sliding over his bum and he just stood there like a sweet horse, just uh, taking no notice of her. And I thought to myself, I bloody love that horse. I want that horse to come. So over he came to uh, the stables and the very first thing we had was his passport to look at. So you'll see here that his, his passport name is Ballyferra to Murphy. We know when he was born. We don't know unfortunately who his people were because there's nothing in the passport, but we know who bred him, Sarah Miller from Ballyferreta. And actually this week, while I was preparing this talk, I tracked her down through Facebook and uh, I found out, first of all, where Bertie was born, which is the very far west of Ireland at the west, on, west coast, at the very end of the Dingle Peninsula. And Sarah very kindly sent, sent me some photographs of Bertie when he was a young horse. Here he is in, the, in his field with his friends. He's about four years old when these pictures were taken. So he looks really cute, very sweet. So over he came to Wimbledon and the very first outing he had, this is Carol's friend Jenny riding him down in, in the sand ring. And he looks a little bit rough and ready. Of course, the horses have come all the way from Ireland and it's a very long journey. It's a very tiring journey. They've had to stand up all the way in the lorry. So they're really pretty exhausted. Uh, so he went out the very next day feeling really very tired and uh, as you can see he looks a bit shaggy and uh, not quite the polished Wimbledon village horse that he is now and the very shortly after this he, he succumbed to a terrible attack of, uh, of ringworm so he ended up going straight into quarantine and, uh, and uh, feeling a little bit sorry for himself. But things perked up and he, uh, Christmas came along and this is us on Christmas morning celebrating together. This was my best Christmas present ever. My new horse Bertie uh, and we were very happy. And over the next few years, Bertie made a lot of great friends at the yard. He had a lot of great adventures and you can see here him riding with Nadia. He, you see him doing the sponsored ride meeting Terry on the, on, the, um, on the bike ride and bathing in Penn Pond. But then things started to go wrong and unfortunately things went wrong almost exactly a year ago, uh, the beginning of May 2019. And in hindsight, things had not been right for a little while before this. So we used to have a, a two hour pole work lesson and a jumping lesson on a Tuesday morning. And, Bertie hated that lesson. He really didn't want to canter. He was incredibly grumpy, which I couldn't understand because later in the week, by Thursday, by Saturday, he was super, but Tuesday morning really didn't suit him. And in the run up to this week, the, the last week in April, Kat spotted that he wasn't moving very comfortably in the arena and we wondered if he'd gone lame. Uh, he didn't look lame when he was trotted up. So he was sent away to Manor Farm for about 10 days to have a break. He came back on bank holiday Monday. Some of you will remember this was Merlin and Onyx's birthday. We had a little birthday party for them in the yard. And then the very next day, the Tuesday morning, Bertie tied up. 
Now this isn't a picture of Bertie, this is a picture of another horse tying up, and this is what tying up looks like. The reason you can see every muscle in this horse's body standing out is because these muscles are rock hard. Imagine the very worst cramp you've ever had, and this is affecting the horse all over its back, all over its quarters. It's very, very painful and very, very stressful for the horse. They can hardly move. I didn't even know what tying up was, and when I looked it up, I had such a fright, because as some of you know, I'm a kidney specialist, and I look after patients, humans who have a similar condition. We don't call it tying up, we call it rhabdomyolysis, and it is actually very dangerous. It's, it's an emergency, because these muscles are not just inflamed and tense and painful, they're actually breaking down, and they're releasing the material from inside the muscle cells, is breaking out and, dis and going into the bloodstream and those toxins can, can uh, block the kidneys and put you into kidney failure and they can actually stop the heart as well. So I was in a real panic when I heard that this had happened to Bertie. This is an emergency. Ruddock came up immediately to see him, made the diagnosis and the treatment really to save Bertie was to put up a drip. And so Bertie went into Rafferty's box and that you can see the drip there in his neck. He had about 20 liters of fluid flushed through his veins that afternoon to flush out the toxins that were poisoning his system. I came up to see him at the end of the afternoon. He was standing at the back of Rafferty's box and when he looked, he turned around and when he saw me, he gave a little nicker as if to say, thank God you're here. And I tell you, my heart nearly broke. He was so sorry for himself and he was almost unrecognizable. He puffed up with fluid because of all the fluid that had gone into his system. And then the next day Ruddick came back and did some more blood tests, but things hadn't really got better. So the following day, which was the Friday, another 20 liters of fluid. And little by little, the blood test started to improve to the point where we could move Bertie down to Manor Farm. And Raddock went down there and checked his blood tests once or twice a week. And the blood tests started to get a little bit better, but they didn't become normal. And what wasn't clear to us was why was Bertie suffering this tr tremendous muscle injury? It wasn't clear. He's not a polo pony, a racehorse. He'd not been sprinting around. He was just standing around in the field. And eventually, after some thought, the, the penny dropped and some blood work was sent off to Holland where the diagnosis was made. And what Bertie has is a condition called Monday morning disease. Now Monday morning disease has been known about for hundreds of years. It used to affect, it, it affects working horses who used to work all through the week and then they would have Sunday off. They would be sitting in the stable having their rich grain feed and on Monday morning back into work, the horse would tie up. So this was a well-known condition and a very, very dangerous and worrying condition, but it wasn't clear what was the cause of this condition. But in the last few years, it's been discovered that the cause of this condition is actually a genetic abnormality. So Bertie has a, a genetic abnormality which causes him to store a lot of sugar and starch in his muscles. Those of you who might do long distance running or long bike rides, you know your carbohydrate load before a, a long race. Bertie is carbohydrate loading all the time. He's stuffing sugar and starch into his muscles. And once the muscles are really full, 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 the muscle fibers, the muscle cells start to break down and you get this very dangerous condition. And you can see with these pictures of these horses that eventually the muscles will start to shrivel. And you can see these two horses here, the back ends are really shrunken down because the muscles have started to shrivel. So here we have a horse now who has an incurable genetic condition. And Radek said, I don't think he's going to be a riding school horse anymore. I don't know what you're going to have to do with him. And it was a terrible time for me because I thought, where are we going to go? Where are we going to go, me and Bertie? And then fortunately, Jenny, Carol's friend, came back into the picture and she said, I have a horse who, I have a friend who has a horse who has this and she competes him in cross country. So Carol said, well, if she can do it, then we can do it. So Bertie came back to the yard. And as you can see, he'd been enjoying his time in the field. He'd been pigging out on the lovely rich spring grass. He's as fat as a little porker pig here, isn't he? So he came back looking absolutely enormous. 
And of course, he was very unfit and we had to work out how to manage him now with this condition. There's a lot of stuff on the internet about this, predominantly from America, and I read everything that I could find. And the main way you manage this condition is through a very, very careful diet. So Bertie has a very special diet. So Claire rang the nutritionist at Top Spec who came up with a diet which is bespoke for Bertie. It's basically low in sugar, low in starch. And curiously, he has a high requirement for salt. He needs a lot of salt because he sweats a lot. He loses salt in the sweat. He gets very dehydrated. And that caused us some problems during the very hot summer when he became a little bit dehydrated and looked as if he was going to tie up again. So he gets a tablespoon of salt in every feed. And when the weather's hot, he gets double that. And if you've looked in his box, you'll see he has a very big salt lick in there as well. It's also very important that the hay that he gets is soaked to get all the sugar content out of it. Of course, we do soak the hay for all the horses, but Bertie's has to be super well soaked to make sure it's very, very low in sugar. He also has a very high vitamin E supplement. This is a, an antioxidant to mop up some of those toxins that can leak into his bloodstream. So he gets a high dose of vitamin E with every feed. And as I'm sure you know, he's not allowed any treats. So that's why he lives on the back corridor of the stables. We've had this sign made for his door. He's not allowed apples or carrots or all the other good things he used to like, but he does get special treats. Those of you who've been to the arena will know that he gets his own special treats, which are low in sugar and low in starch and safe for Bertie. So very careful diet is how this is managed, but diet itself isn't the whole story. You have to exercise the horse very carefully. So Bertie is not allowed any rest days. He has to work every day, including Mondays when all the other horses are resting. And to start with, don't forget, he was very fat and he was also very unfit. So I had a, an app to help me get him back into work. And you can see from the app, our little routes around Wimbledon Common, the blue is we're just walking and the red are very, very short trots. And eventually after a month, we managed to add in some canter work and slowly we built him up to full fitness. And what you can see on the right is Nadia riding him. Nadia and Poppy have been marvelous the way they've helped with him so that he goes out on a Monday with Terry riding him and either Nadia or, or Poppy riding with them. But of course he's a horse, he can't live in a box forever. So he does occasionally get to go away. So at the moment he's going to Manor Farm once a week to really just kick his heels and have a good time. And here he is really going for it. You wouldn't have thought a horse could fly, but there's Bertie having a really good run around the field at Manor Farm. And there he is looking incredibly pleased with himself at the end of it. And I'm gonna show you a video. I hope you'll be able to see this. This is Bertie working in the sand ring. So you can see really how nicely he's going now. Of course, it's not just about me and Bertie. I really want to say thank you to some of the people who've helped immensely to get him back to full fitness. Obviously, Radek the vet, Carol who believed that we could do this, and the huge amount of attention and effort and work that Claire has put in, and Nadia too. So from Bertie and me, thank you all. And I'm now gonna hand you back to Carol at the yard. Hi everybody, hi. Thank you so much Rachel, that was a lovely story. It was a very emotional time for all of us when Bertie was ill because it was really touch and go. Um, but it was your love and your dedication that really got him through. So it was a lovely story, thank you so much. Now we're gonna go back again, uh, going on from what we were talking about earlier about contact. I think you can see Nadia here. So the simulator is a wonderful way for you to be able to check how your contact is going when you're riding. And Nadia is now just using what we call an equicue, just to practice keeping a good contact on the reins and keeping our hands still. So this simulates the equicide for people who don't know it. It's very interactive. It'll tell you how much rein you're using, 
how much leg you use. But if we're just focusing today on rain, there's an auto training test that you can do. And I don't know if I hold that up quite close to the camera. If you can see here, this are, these are the rain sensors for someone who was quite a novice rider. And I don't know if you can see how much this rider's hands are moving. Okay, so it's very easy to you to come in and practice, put it onto auto training and see how good your hands are. So as a comparison, this is what uh, Nadia's rain sensors look like. Okay, so you can see there's absolutely no um, pulling on the reins. It's just a light, even contact all the way down. So that's what we're all heading for. So Nadia's first of all practicing riding with the block like this. And you can do this walk, trot, and canter. Look how lovely and still her hands are. And now we're just going to take the block away. So we're just going to take the block away just to show that once that's gone, well done. <laughs> Thanks, Nadia. Brilliant. So again, just watch her hands now. And particularly, watch her elbows. Do you see how soft her elbows are and how soft her hands are? And her hands and elbows are just following through the movement of the horse's head. I want you to really watch Nadia's elbows closely now when I just tell her in a moment to stiffen her arms and elbows. So when you're ready, Aunt Nadia, now. So did you see what happened? As soon as she stiffened her arms and her elbows, it didn't look like much, but the sensitivity of this horse, sensitivity, sensitivity of this horse, meant that he came back and she stopped it straight away. So just canter on again and we'll just see that. So it just shows when you're riding, you know, horses can be very forgiving and they can sometimes let you get away with using rain aids and they don't actually stop because they kind of think, oh, I don't think you really meant that and they just carry on. But to be the best rider you can be, you really do want to be riding with lovely, lovely soft hands. Um, and so you can practice this on the sim. Once again, Nadia, lock your hands. And again, as soon as her elbows stop following the horse, then look what happened, she stopped the horse. So I think that was very well demonstrated. And as soon as you can come back riding, you've all got to get practicing on the sim. But now we're gonna hand over to Lottie because Lottie's got some fabulous exercises so you can practice and get your hands and your arms positions better. Thanks over to you, Lottie. Okay, hi. Hi everybody, nice to see you all. Um, okay, so um, we've seen how uh, we, we've, over the past few weeks, we've covered our lower body, we've covered um, our core. I'm going to work on chest and back next week, but the muscle I want to focus on today, or the muscle groups I want to focus on today, are your shoulders, um, or rather your rotator cuffs. Um, we need these muscles for strength and flexibility, and we use them for things like reaching, off, reaching up to a high shelf to grab things. We use them for brushing our hair. Uh, obviously, we use them for ball sports, tennis, uh, volleyball, but we also use them for swimming as well. Now, again, we'll use them in riding as well. So when we're riding along, if we have a naughty horse that snatches our reins, um, having good scapular strength and flexibility is very, very important so we don't cause any damage. Um, so just very quickly, I won't bore you with the anatomy, we'll get straight to the exercises, but very quickly just to remind you, our shoulders enable a whole range of motion from elevation through to depression, through to protraction, retraction and they allow upward uh, rotation and also downward rotation. So three exercises today, uh, one for the mid-back, the dumb waiter, we'll do planks and we'll do the dolphin exercise as well. So dumb waiter exercise, for those of you that have resistance bands at home, the diner bands, um, you can do this with this, we can do those, this exercise with these or you can do them prone, so laying face down on the floor. Um, I prefer the laying exercises myself. I think you get better, better use of your muscles. Um, but effectively, with a dumb waiter exercise, you can do it with your dyna band. That band's not very stretchy, so I'm not going to attempt it with that. But what you would do is you would tuck your elbows into your side. You'd have your band in your hands. And you can simply, if you're really struggling, you can just simply move your app, uh, rotate your, your fists out and bring it back in. So this is the very, very basic exercise that you can do to strengthen your, your rotator cuff muscles. So whilst you're doing it, you can see your hands, your, everything is aligned and you're simply just opening out like this. So that you're working these muscles. Now, I actually prefer to do these exercises on the floor um, using some very basic mid-back series exercises. What I'll do is I lay down on my mat, it's nice and comfortable. Um, you typically would have your, your head down on the floor. If you're feeling strong, you can lift your chin up. But ideally what you want to do is you want to place your hands at a 90 degree, or your arm should be at a 90 degree angle, like so. Um, hopefully you can see me on the floor. 
Um, and what you want to do is effectively you will inhale. So I'll do this. Sorry, I've got to look away from the camera. So you will inhale to prepare. And then you'll exhale, push your arms forward, and you're making sure in this position that everything is parallel to the floor, okay? So you exhale forward, you make sure that your core is engaged. So at this point, your core is engaged, your neck is long, um, and your arms are stretching forwards. You exhale, you bring those hands back, you squeeze like so, and release. So it's a very simple motion of lifting, extending, bringing those hands and shoulders back, squeezing so that everything is parallel to the floor and releasing. Now you can do that 20 times. It's a super, super simple exercise that anyone can manage and it will give you a basic level of strength. Um, a more demanding or more challenging exercise you can do is the plank. I'm sure you all know what planks are. I just want to show you a couple of very quick variations. Um, the plank strengthens our upper body, but it also maintains that scapular stability as well. You can do this either on your forearms or on your hands. So if you do it on, if you'd like to do it on your forearms because you're not feeling quite so strong, that's fine too. You'll still get the workout you need. All you're doing is on your mat, forearms down, like so. Inhale to prepare. Exhale, really suck those tummy muscles in here. So you're really engaging that core. And as you exhale, you're just lifting your legs out and back, stretching them out and back, and you hold this position. So with any plank, you need to make sure that you're not collapsing in your shoulders, your spine, your lumbar spine is not collapsing. You need to make sure your neck is long and um, it's not stiff. You should be in a neutral position, not looking up and not looking down. So from here, if you're feeling strong, you can simply twist your right hand so it's parallel to your shoulder line and you can just twist around. So this is a side plank, Vasistasana. So this is the simple version. This is really good for keeping those shoulders nice and strong. You just gotta make sure that your elbow is stacked in line with your shoulder and that your hips are stacked as well, neatly. Okay, so that's the simpler version. If you're feeling stronger, you can do it on your arms. So as in a full arm extension. So you come to the same position here, the tabletop position, you inhale, exhale, engage those core muscles and you stretch out like so. You need to make sure that, again, you're not sinking in your shoulders. You've got to keep strong. You need to make sure your lumbar spine is not sinking. It's a pretty good straight line. Neck nice and long. From here, you bring your right hand to the center line, and you slowly twist. Now, from here, you need to make sure that your lower foot, the bottom foot, is planted firmly on the floor. You shouldn't be on the side. You should be pushing that sole down. You need to hitch those hips up as high as you possibly can. And from here, you energize that top arm and reach up. If you're feeling really strong and balanced, you can slowly lift the leg, making sure your hips pushed up. And come down. Now there's one more exercise to show you, which I'll do very quickly because I know we're running out of time. Um, that's the dolphin pose. So again, very simply, these are all on the floor. Make a triangle with your hands with your forearms, clasp your fists, and place them down on the mat. From here, you can do this on your knees, or you can do it with your bottom high in the air, depending on how strong you are. But the purpose of this exercise is, again, we want to get that upper body working. We want that scapular stability, and this exercise will help build that. So forearms on the floor, you can inhale to prepare, exhale, engage the tummy, and you can, from here, you can either go down, to try and touch your chin to the floor and back. So you inhale down and back. But if you're feeling strong, you can effectively just come up onto your toes so you're making a nice V shape. You need to make sure your tummy's tucked in. And from here, you exhale and up and down. Tummy, uh, chin to floor and back. And if you're feeling super strong, you can do it one leg in the air. And the goal is to do about 20 of these, if you're feeling strong. Uh, I'm not today. Um, so those are the exercises I wanted to show you. Um, I want to make sure that if you, again, if you are doing these, you do them on each side. Um, you do the left, then you do the right, so you're even on both sides. And also, if you feel any pain whatsoever, please don't do it. Anyway, I'm going to hand back over to Sasha now, who I think has a new slot to us for us. Yeah, hi, everyone. Thanks, Lottie. Um, I probably won't be giving some of those a go. I had a little go yesterday at some of them. 
but I might get Annabelle to have a go at some of those later. She might be a little bit better than I am at those. So a new, um, a new little feature. I'm going to be really, really quick because, um, you know, we haven't got long. We've overrun a little bit, but we thought we would do at the end of each um, show, TV show, because we're getting, you know, we're getting quite big these days. Um, a sort of top five products that we wouldn't be without as um, as riders, and hopefully, lots of people will have some ideas um, as to what they would like um, to you know, they, they might have their products as well. So first of all, the, my jobbers I absolutely love and actually mum, mum raves about these and they were extremely forgiving for me coming back after having Annabelle are these um, flexor jobbers. So they're really, really comfy and they've got a pocket at the side. I don't know if you can see them pocket at the side to put your phone in because often it can be really difficult when you're riding to find somewhere. If you're not wearing a coat or a jacket with a pocket um, to find somewhere to put your phone um, so they're absolutely amazing. These Ariat boots, I wouldn't be without these in the winter. They are so warm. Um, sorry. Um, they're really, really warm. And um, I haven't had cold feet since I've had these boots. They're absolutely amazing. Um, another thing I wouldn't be without are my Toggy riding socks. You may notice that I try, I wear nice, colorful socks. They come all the way up to my knees, basically. And I like to coordinate them with my outfits. Jen and I used to do that together when we, when we were both working at the stable. It's a little bit sad, but they're really, really comfy. And they're obviously designed to be worn under your boots. So I would recommend investing in some of those. Um, and obviously we had a really horrid winter this year, really, really wet. And something that I definitely wouldn't be without as a rider is waterproof trousers. Quite a lot of the ones that are sold by so the horse companies are not that waterproof and you end up a little soggy which is not nice so these patagonia ones are absolutely amazing um, and they are properly waterproof um, so those are my sort of four and then my final uh, fifth product that i wouldn't be without when i was riding would be my wvs t-shirts and sweatshirts of course i'm wearing them everywhere that's me on safari representing wvs in south africa wearing my wvs stash so as mum said, um, we are going to run a competition. It's competition time. Now, lots of you are probably watching a lot more daytime TV than you usually would be. And, um, you know, they're giving away 40 grand on this morning or something. We're only giving away a WVS t-shirt retailing at approximately 15 pounds. Um, but just answer the following question. Pop it in the chat. <laughs> Count up on a horse the number of ears plus frogs plus hocks plus withers. Send it in the chat over to me or to everyone. Okay, first answer through Mandy Merrin, Honey's owner, wins her WVS t-shirt. The total is nine. Absolutely fabulous. Well done. Um, so those are the top five products. We'll send you through those in the email um, when mom sends out everything uh, next week. The jobbers currently there's 30% off on the website. So when that comes through, get on quickly if you want to want some new jotties because um, they're 30% off. So now's a good time to buy. So over to mum and see you all soon. Hi, Sash, that was great. Thank you so much. I think that's a really nice new feature. And if you want to be on it next week, let us know. So thank you all so much for watching. We really hope you enjoyed it. Thank you everybody who helps with the show, took part in it. Please do stay on and chat afterwards. Otherwise, oh, here comes this is Sergeant OBC and Alfredo Wagons. Otherwise, bye now or see you next week. Bye. bye. bye.